Hello, everybody, and welcome to Enterprise Sales Development. I'm Eric Quanstrom, CMO of Science. And I'm Caroline Maloney, the Director of Sales Training and Enablement at Science. So we have a fun journey to talk about today with our guest, Rob Simmons, who's the current VP of Sales Development at Lean Data. And, you know, Rob kind of started as a football coach. <laughs> that was his professional <laughs> journey. And then moved to kind of a number one sales role, um, been on the, the inside sales side for a long time, worked for Audit Board, led their sales team or inside sales team, uh, and then became a customer of Lean Data and, and kind of has one of those um, age old transformations of being kind of a number one customer of a product that he really loves um, to taking over the mantle and, and joining them as a VP of sales development and leading their team of uh, 20 plus SDRs now. Yeah. And speaking of that big team, he scaled that team. Uh, so he's responsible for a lot of their growth. He talks a lot about that. And Eric, it's interesting, you know, he talks a lot about how his experience as a football coach informs his leadership style and his approach to coaching and leadership today. Really cool. Uh, listen, listen for the end too. He brings out a huge laminated sheet for objection handling. So he goes into detail there. Really cool stuff. Great takeaways. Great takeaways. So really insightful um, management episode for a lot of tips and tricks that I think our audience can take away from. Let's get to it. One of the things that I'd love to just jump to the top of the mountain and talk about is, you know, we're on with Rob Simmons and Rob, you've, you've actually got an upcoming kind of like presentation, you know, in your role as, you know, VP of sales development at Lean Data. Um, one of the things, one of the events that you've got upcoming is called Scaling Sales Development. And anyone that's going to put that on has to know a thing or two about <laughs> actually scaling sales development. Yeah. And I'd love to learn um, what you've learned. Sure. Yeah, it's um, so I've, I've chosen this career path um, focusing on sales development over the last, I don't know, five years or so. So I've been in software sales for about 10 years. I started um, before that um, actually as an SDR in the mortgage industry. And it was like one of those things where you're attached to a power dialer right to your ear uh, and you were just smiling and dialing all day trying to convince people to refinance their homes. Uh, I found that I was really good at it. I was making pretty good money, but I was not excited about the work I was doing in the industry. And so I pivoted to, um, tech. Fortunately, I found tech, made the leap. Um, my wife and I both moved up to San Francisco to just go like all into this and, um, got my first role as a, like a mid-market AE. And, um, as I, got into sales, it became infectious. You, you love the thrill of the hunt. You love closing deals and things. Um, and for me, having like a sports athletic background in football and then football coaching, I always love like mentoring and coaching um, younger reps and helping them kind of start uh, launching their career and having success like I did when I got into tech from some amazing mentors. And so that kind of like naturally gravitated me towards sales development. And I took on um, responsibilities everywhere I had been to build out like new hire sales onboarding programs and then eventually like run SDR teams. And um, so, yeah, it kind of led me to this career path where um, I focused, like I've had opportunities to get into leading AE teams, but I'm like, nah, I just love working with the young people and helping people launch their career. And um, so like most recently doing that at audit board, basically coming in with like, you know, I inherited like four reps, basically super early stage startup. And um, like we had to build out the sales tech stack and get the right tools in place. And then we had to get, uh, I'll do a ton of hiring. So we took it from like four people to like 25 people over the course of like that first year there. And so I, um, that would got, be scaling right there. That is, I was going to say, so that to bring it back to your question, like that is scaling. Six X. that's hyper growth and it's a lot of fun. Um, it's really cool. I've learned a lot along the way about like, kind of what, what do you look for in SDRs? Um, what kind of tools do you need to have in place? And then how do you, you know, keep your top people feeling like they're, they're learning and growing and keep them motivated. And, um, you know, occasionally how do you, like people that ultimately like aren't going to be successful in this, like, how do you help them find something else? So, and speaking of scalability, how do you retain, like, what, what are your thoughts on employee retention, right? When you're scaling at that pace and you have folks who are great fits for potential moves within the company, but you also have folks who you really want to keep where they are because they're so valuable on your team. What are your thoughts on retention there? Yeah, it's, it's a balancing act, right? Like, it's, um, you, you, I think the average is like 14, 15 months that someone's in a sales development rep role. Um, and 
pretty much like the, the people, the best people, like they're, they're hungry and they want to move up into account executive or customer success or, I mean, at Lean Data, I'm really fortunate to have an organization that's supportive of SDRs going all over the company. We have people in BD and partnerships and people in RevOps and all kinds of cool roles that were former SDRs. So that's really neat being a sales development leader. It's um, it's it's fun to like have success and build the pipeline and, and see us hit our, our ARR goals, uh, annual recurring revenue. But um, when I can see people like get to go off and fulfill their dreams and doing other things in their career, that's really, really cool and powerful. Um, so yeah, I, what I've kind of found is like, your your top players like yes you want to keep them in seat but at the same time you, you do have to continuously show them growth and give them more opportunity to 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 learn and take on additional responsibility and so um i've got examples like on my team right now for people that aspire to get into sales development leadership and so for them like we'll bring them into um hiring manager interviews like teach them how to interview um we'll have them be mentors to new hires and then get their feedback on like, what do they wish they would have been taught when they got here six months ago, 12 months ago. And then like, let's use their experience to better build out our onboarding program. And so you can find projects like that for them where um, they're helping you, but you're also helping them like grow and develop new skills and feel rewarded for everything they're doing. Um, you also have other AEs that solely, you know, they did just want to go sales, right? They want to go be AEs. And so for them, you know, I talk with um, our AE leadership and let them know, hey, like you got to have this person on your radar. They're amazing. They're a killer. They're going to do great as an AE someday. And I, I want that to be here. Um, and then talk with their AE counterparts as well. So that their AEs know what their aspirations are and they can keep them engaged and actually like bring them along for the whole sales cycle too. Not just, hey, first call, pass it off. Like let the, eight, the SDR stick around and learn the whole sales process. Um, and that's been really good for our, our um, revenue org at, at Lean Data. We have about half of our AEs are former SDRs from the company. And just to get a, a sense of kind of like size and scope at Lean Data, how many SDRs do you currently have? We have, I think, 22 at the moment. My headcount approved for this year is 25. Um, like any good sales development leader, I'm always trying to stretch that. So <laughs> I'll round up to like 28 is probably because because we talked about like the, the turnover is pretty high in the role. Now we have great attrition. I credit that to having a really strong, healthy culture. Uh, we don't generally have like people leaving for um, other SDR gigs. Um, so... Um, yeah, we, we have to like, part of my philosophy is like, I always have to be recruiting It's probably the most important part of my job is to always have a pipeline of SDRs and always kind of have a bench to pull from whenever I have mm. a territory I got to like plug and fill. And are you guys like fully um, remote or do you have most of those folks in, in SF? Um, we're spread amongst three metros. So we're going to go into more of the hybrid model starting next month in um so we'll have like probably two collaboration days in the office where we'll try and do the bulk of our meetings and get together as a team on those days for trainings and things. And then the other three days a week is like heads down, let's grind. Um, so we have people in um, like San Jose, Santa Clara, and then Denver, and then San Diego, we're, we're starting to build out is our newest market. And I just got a uh, SDR manager down there. Lovely. It, it's great. great beautiful city of San Diego. I love San you, you Diego. You won't be disappointed. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm just uh, a little north in Orange County, so I'm not too far. <laughs> Beautiful down there. I'm very jealous of you both. It's a lot of snow <laughs> on the ground here. Uh, but Rob, I, I, I want to uh, take it back and, and talk a little bit more about your experience as a coach, um, you know, a, a sports coach. I believe it was football, correct? Is, is yeah. That yeah. So I want to talk to you more about that and, and get to know a little bit more about how that transition from coaching into sales happened. Yeah. I mean, I'd love to say it was like a master plan. It's not. I think it's like so many people. I, I graduated college and I had no idea what I wanted to do. I wasn't like really thinking of far that that much ahead. Like I just knew I was really passionate about football. And so um, when I ultimately decided to like hang up my cleats and realized I was out of my league trying to play division one college football, uh, the, the natural progression was like, okay, how do I stay involved with the program? I can like go try and be a student assistant, like in the, the, um, with the equipment team, but I really wanted to be like closer and be more like tactical and be part of the X's and O's still of the sport, if you will. So I basically did my best SDRing and I went into the football offices and just kind of sat there until, um, one of the coaches would take a meeting with me. And, uh, fortunately Rick Neuheisel, the old coach at UCLA took, gave me a few minutes and listened to me and heard me out. And I guess kind of saw that I was pretty passionate about the sport and uh, 
So I was uh, earned an opportunity to help on the defensive side of the, the football um, team for the coaching staff for a bit. And great experience. I did that while I was a student and then um, did it for a year after college as well. Um, ultimately, though, uh, like any again, any good salesperson, I, I found I was a bit money motivated and that wasn't necessarily being satisfied as a young uh, coach in uh, West L.A. So um, that's where sales kind of came in. I was like, all right, I need, I want to start making some real paychecks. I want to do something where I can dictate how much I'm going to make and get to talk to people. And so I found sales and then obviously you got to get some experience before you can ultimately come back to, to teaching sales to people. That's great. And I noticed that you used the word player for your own team members, you know, on your SDR team. So do you think that it's, it's, there's a lot of relevant, I guess, sports analogies or carryover there with the way that maybe you lead? <clears throat> I think so. I, I mean, I try not to like use too many sports analogies because I don't want to ever like alienate people that are into it. Um, <laughs> but I can't help myself sometimes. I, I just got off some training and I'm talking about like our account intelligence solution that we use. And I'm explaining how it's kind of like a fish finder and it tells you which accounts to, you know, go fishing in, if that makes sense. So I definitely um, I'm a pretty heavy sports analogy guy. I do think like team sports are great. I mean, individual sports too, but I, I do love people that come from a team sports background. I think it um, just breeds the right kind of culture of like competitiveness, but not at the expense of others. Like we're a team here together and we can help each other and all be successful together is very much the culture I try and instill within my, my teams. And uh, we just, um, you know, brought on an SDR who's a, who's a competitive swimmer, a D1 competitive swimmer in college. And the um, future looks super, super bright for her too. And I think it's just that it takes so much discipline to be an athlete at that level that, you know, she's going to do whatever it takes to be successful at whatever you put in front of her. Do you find that, like, that that's something that is even working its way back into kind of like the hiring structure that you referenced earlier where, hey, you're looking for, that competitive greatness, that poise, things that, you know, might manifest in team sports or as a background? Yeah. So it's when I first got into like a leadership role and was hiring for the first time, I definitely grad gravitated towards salespeople. Like I would tell my recruiter, like, let's go find former athletes. Yeah. But I've realized, so like, there's nothing wrong with that. Former athletes are great. Um, they, it's definitely a good indicator to look for when you have someone that doesn't have a lot of professional experience yet. Um, however, I would say my, uh, like ideal SDR persona that I'm going to hire has definitely broadened since then. And I've, I've realized that you can find SDRs with like any background whatsoever. And it's more about like the intangibles that, that they have. And so for me, I kind of, I've come up with this acronym, we call it the four C's, um, and it used to be the three C's, but one of my SDRs that I've hired here at Lean Data has, has challenged me and we've added a fourth C because of him. And I can kind of tell his story in a sec. But um, so the, 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 the three C's that are now the four C's was um, intellectual curiosity, uh, coachability, and character. So if they have those three things, and especially like the, the curiosity part for me is like number one, it's doesn't, you don't have to be a genius to be successful at sales. I think we know that. I'm certainly not. Um, but you do have to have a growth mindset and you gotta be someone that's curious. And you're always asking the, how, the, why, and you're constantly learning because those people, even if they come with no experience will eventually be your top SDRs because they'll always grow and always get better. Um, the fourth one we've added recently is creativity. And so one of, one of my newer SDRs is not anymore. Um, but, uh, this gentleman, uh, has a music background. So he was like, had kind of built his own little music studio and um, was like producing and stuff and thought that was going to be his career. But then he lives in Silicon Valley and, you know, wants to make some money and get in, got into tech at the recommendation of some, some people around him. And uh, so he's naturally very creative. He's a musician and he's found in his, he brought this to me about six months into being an SDR. He's like, I, do you guys test for creativity? And I was like, you know, I look for it a little bit in the like pre and post interview engagement that I get from the candidate and like, the, what kind of email do they send me after? Um, but I, no, I don't really test for it. And he challenged me on that. Like, think about all the creativity that goes into prospecting and extracting information from someone's LinkedIn and their company website and stuff like that. And then tailoring your, your personalization. And I was like, oh, that makes a ton of sense. So now we test for creativity too. And, um, just makes a ton of sense. I mean, I think about some of our top SDRs that came in with no sales experience and the reason they're good is because they are curious, they're coachable, they have high character and um, 
they're creative. They just like, I've read some of the emails that they personalize. I'm like, wow, that, that's really cool. Like you extracted that they had been in the X games as a skier and like weaved that into your outreach and then somehow pivoted it into, you know, how lean data helps um, their company be more successful. I'm like, that's impressive. Yeah. And I see that you spent some time training uh, salespeople, you know, specifically as, as a training team lead. And I'm curious, you know, for folks who are coming in with a lot of really great soft skills, right? Like communication, empathy, curiosity, all those, all those things. What do you think is the most important thing that you can do when onboarding or training a new SDR, aside from having them have those great soft skills coming into it? Oh man, that's, that's tough. Like if I can only choose one, that's hard. So we, we train them on so many things. I'm fortunate again, that we've got a great enablement team that's helped me build this really good program out for onboarding SDRs um, that covers everything. I think nowadays, um, you know, being really proficient with the tech stack is important. Um, I'm assuming, like you said, they've already got good verbal acuity. They're, they're good at like building rapport with people and stuff like that. Then, um, yeah, I think the next big thing is like um, tech to work efficiently and effectively. Um, you know, if I'm going to go after 200 accounts, like I, I can't, I can't do everything manual. I got to like really leverage my full tech stack to its full capabilities. And, um, you know, I had the privilege to work at outreach for a year in my career and, uh, that year um, really taught me a lot. I'm like really appreciative for that year that I spent there because it, it taught me the ins and outs of outreach, which is, you know, largely powers what, what we do as a, an SDR team. Yeah. And with that, do you have any suggestions? Maybe some of our uh, listeners could get some insight from you here. Do you have any suggestions for certifications or anything, you know, tangible that someone who wants to be an SDR can do prior to the interview process to get some of those tech skills under their belts? Yeah, good question. Um, so I've, I've leveraged um, some outside uh, SDR staffing um, in the past because, um, well, actually even today a little bit because our recruiting team can be spread pretty thin, trying to fill a lot of roles. We're growing fast. They're trying to fill roles across the whole company. Um, and so there are a lot, I think there's just so much more focus on SDR and BDRs nowadays and how important they are to revenue organizations that there are a lot more resources out there. Um, I've worked with companies like Vendition and Memory Blue and, and some of these companies that help both like train and onboard and source SDRs. So um, I know that some of those people can come in with a little bit more skill set and stuff than, than your general person off the street that hasn't done this before. Um, I'm sure LinkedIn has tons of good stuff. I'm not super privy to it though. I'm actually really curious about, you used the word privilege um, when talking about your time at, at Outreach. What are some of the things, what are some of the takeaways? And I guess Lean Data would actually even be in the same cohort where it's very meta, right? Like you're working with a tech stack product that actually serves in kind of like the role that <laughs> frankly we all play. Um, Give me some of the insights that you took away from your time at Outreach. Yeah, so um, being at a company that sells a sales solution to salespeople was really unique. Like it's very sales centric, very sales heavy culture, um, uh, both you know from good and bad, bad sides to that. Um, but it was cool to get to sell to salespeople. It was a challenge because you're kind of held to a higher bar. Like if you go try and sell to a CRO, like they'll, they'll listen to you. They'll give you a, they'll give you a moment, but you, you better be good and you better have your pitch ready. You better be a good listener, all that kind of stuff and ask really good questions because they'll also shut you down super fast because they respect good sales acumen. Um, so I definitely learned that. Like it made me a more, I would say like a little bit more assertive, a little bit more aggressive seller. Um, and then, um, man, everything I learned about the product itself, all the ins and outs and everything it can you know, do for you to help your team work more efficiently on an account-based sales motion. Um, but then also all the like metrics that you should be measuring, right? Like um, I can give somebody a quota, but I also need to teach them all the leading indicators that are going to get you to that quota. So I'm very much like a performance-driven manager. I don't want to harp on activity that goes back to like why I hire for characters. I want very self-motivated people that are, you know, going to be successful and hold themselves accountable. So, you know, Hey, your quote is like, let's say eight qualified first calls this month that need to run. Um, 
I, because of my time at outreach, I think I learned the, all the metrics that we need to coach on that will get them there. So everything from, okay, 80% of the meetings are going to run. So you need to like overshoot that. So book 10 meetings in order to get the eight that are qualified that run at the end of the month. And then to even get to those 10 booked, like how many calls do you need to make this week? How many emails do you need to send? And before you even get to that, um, how many people do you have in sequence? So like for us, we have, like, we call it the sweet spot. You got to have four to 600 people active in sequence and outreach at any given time to have those number of tasks. And then those four to 600 need to come from anywhere from like hundred to 200 unique accounts. It really depends on your segment that you're selling into and the size of company. But, um, so I'm able to train my team. Hey, you got to take care of all these leading indicators. And ultimately, if you do all that, it's going to net you into hitting your quota. Um, so I think like that level of detail and the metrics of coaching, um, I definitely learned there because that's how they treated all of us. That's how we were trained. And then that's not even getting into all the logistics of sequences and like, what's the right number of touch points and how spread out should they be? And, you know, leveraging all your channels at your disposal. I, um, a lot of that training came from those, that, that one year I spent there too. You have a perspective on kind of like ideal sequence length, ideal cadencing, ideal um, number of channels incorporated? Yeah, I do. We could probably do a whole nother hour on <laughs> sequence strategy <laughs> and outreach and stuff. But um, yeah, I mean, so, so generally um, we go for about 30 days, um, somewhere between like 28 and 30 days is a sequence for us. Um, and that might be anywhere from like 12 to as high as like 15 different touch points in that sequence, definitely leveraging every channel at your disposal. Um, phone is not dead. I know a lot of companies don't want to, you know, use the phone anymore at outreach. They teach you the phone is the ATM. You got to pick up the phone to make the money. And uh, the phone still works. And I, I, I'm a big preacher of using, leaving voicemails, even if you don't catch people, right? Because if it's only one, 2% that are answering the phone, yeah, but leave the voicemail because I like, I might not answer the call, but I always listen to the voicemail that I got. So those are great leave behinds. Um, that's a tip I would you know, suggest for everybody's leave voicemails. The other thing is LinkedIn's really become a strong channel for us lately. So don't neglect that. And um, good place to, uh, you know, connect with your, your prospects. You don't need to like immediately connect and pitch, um, but, but connect with them. Um, and then as you share your company's, um, you know, content and stuff like that, you're, you're building awareness, you're building familiarity. And then that way, um, when they see your, your, your phone call and they see your email and stuff like that, they can kind of put a face to the name and they'll remember you. So do you like to structure a lot of your sequences with, um, say LinkedIn up front, um, where that connection is happening maybe early in the first few touches? Uh, I do. Yeah. So, um, used to always be right. Like it would just be phone, email, phone, email, phone, email. Phone. And, and now we're, we're going more towards like a double or triple tap, like right up front. We want to, um, email call LinkedIn, like all within the first 24 hours so we can build some familiarity with them and show them we're, we're serious about meeting with them and put the face to the name, all that. Um, so yes, I, I absolutely like uh, a LinkedIn connection. I, again, I don't think you want to slide right into their messages right away, um, but you, you should connect and you should personalize that, that connection request as well. Um, I, I can tell you from experience, I get a lot of connection requests that are they don't personalize or put any context. And it's like, if I don't know you and you didn't give me any reason for why I should connect with you, I'm probably not going to, because I try and keep my network as legit as possible, not just accepting every single person. Yeah, and, and speaking of cadence structure, I'm curious because a lot of people have polarizing opinions on when to inject use cases or you know customer success stories. What do you think about that uh, You know, within the cadence structure? What do you think about, you know, customer case studies, injecting that? And when, when do you do that typically? Yeah. So absolutely you have to, um, I call them proof points that it needs to be a proof point that you can solve challenges that they have. That's what it's all about. Um, the key is really making sure that they're relevant. Like you can't just drop any, any proof point in there. It's gotta be something like if I'm, um, you know, trying to sell to Salesforce, I'm going to give them an Oracle, you know, proof point or something like that. It, it's got to be highly relevant to them. Otherwise they're going to look at it and be like, what do I have in common with this tiny startup? It's nothing to do with what we do here. So what do you know about my pain and how can you help me? Um, so yeah, we do. Um, we, pe we pepper them throughout the, you know, the, the sequence. Um, there's not like any one necessarily place. It kind of depends on the flow of the sequence. The goal of a sequence is right. It should like kind of tell a story 
and kind of build upon itself. So there's going to be a natural point where up front you're you're kind of trying to build credibility and and get their peak their interest and then if that's not working then you're going to come around to okay let me give you some proof points so i can show you this is how we help this company i really love the idea of a narrative arc as part of the sequencing um largely because i think that people are busy bombarded and bewildered most of the time when you're in the prospect seat right like if you're approached as some of us are multiple times a day by many different sdrs um it's uh it's kind of a catch as catch can type of what what penetrates through. So I'm curious to learn, like maybe you could even apply um, lean data and, and the story that you're looking to tell, you know, just to give an example to our, our audience and our listeners of, of kind of what that narrative arc looks like for you guys. Yeah, absolutely. So if anyone's not familiar, so, so lean data is uh, what we call a revenue orchestration platform. And we're like the only Salesforce native revenue orchestration platform out there. Essentially, we live in Salesforce. We make Salesforce better for you. So I was previously a customer, which we didn't talk about. That's how I ended up getting to lean data. I was a customer first and um, uh, had the opportunity to meet um, the CEO, Evan Lang, and uh, CRO, Steve DeMarco, and kind of fell in love with both guys. I already was in love with the product because it solved real business problems for me at, at um, Audit Board. So as part of that, I came over here to leave the company. Um, and so lean data solves challenges around getting the right leads, contacts, accounts to the right reps in real time, all automated. So someone downloads a white paper from your website. Uh, in the olden times, reps had to typically like sit there, look at that and decide, okay, is this a customer? Is this a prospect? If it's a prospect, is there an open opportunity or not? And like triage the whole thing and takes minutes to ultimately get it to the right person. Ton of manual work. Lean data basically automates that. It looks to um, check your Salesforce instance. Does this account already exist? Does this lead already exist? If so, simply convert it and send a notification. If it doesn't, create the new record. And um, we can even integrate with the sales engagement platforms to auto sequence or auto cadence so we can get your speed to lead much, much faster. Um, and so for us, yeah, if we're, we're typically going to any Salesforce customer. That's pretty much our, our marketplace. We can go sell to anyone that's using Salesforce CRM. So um, we want to go reach out to any, any company that's, that's using Salesforce and um, basically ask them, I mean, like, are you struggling with getting the right leads, contacts, accounts to the right reps? Do you know how long it's taking your reps to follow up? Do you have like any SLAs in place for tracking that? Um, what do you do with reps constantly moving territories and making sure you're equitably distributing these leads and accounts to the right people? And if it's generally for me, it's like, I want to ask questions like, are these business problems for you? Because if they're not, then great. We, we, you know, we're probably not a fit and that's okay. But if you are struggling with any of this, then there is a better way. And like, for me, I, I used to just think there wasn't a better way. These were just problems you had to deal with being in the head of sales development, but I realized there's not, I eventually found lean data and uh, solved a lot of my challenges. So I think that's, you know, um, pretty powerful stuff. So I want to understand, do they have any relevant pain to what we solve for? And um, that's usually how I will craft an email is asking some specific questions. And if, um, you know, pretty good response rate, like if, if any of those things are relevant to them right now, they're going to respond and say, yeah, hopefully. Um, if not, then the sequence is going to go on to um, give them some examples of companies similar to them that we've helped and see if, if maybe that type of messaging will, will um, be relevant to them. And then we're trying some things later in sequences, like incorporating video messaging or incorporating a gift, um, you know, other tactics, other channels that we can leverage kind of as like a final attempt if we haven't gotten your attention so far. Interesting use of gifting um, on the back end, right? Like, yeah, nothing else cuts through the clutter. Maybe uh, the reciprocity of gifts is uh, yeah. something to some, try. Some people's affection, mine sometimes too, can be can be bought <laughs> so, <laughs> over a, a nice bottle of wine or a bottle of bourbon or something. So um, yeah, offer somebody a little treat for 30 minutes of their time. Um, and, and yeah, you do that later in the sequence because it's you don't want to play all your cards first. Like, let's see if we can organically win your attention um, and, and potentially help your business up front. If that doesn't work, let's at least, you know, maybe bribe you a little bit and just see if we can get some of your time to better understand your business and see if we might be a fit. And, and you can only do that if you do have a, I mean, I guess you could throw out gift cards and whatever to people at any time, but it'd be a big waste if you had a crappy solution. The way I think about it is like, we've got a great solution where, uh, that we're bringing to market to help these people. And we, we just need a little extra nudge to help get them over the edge to saying yes, to give us some time. 
Yeah, one of the things that's really um, kind of resonant with what you're saying to me is a lot of the the idea that, <clears throat> hey, we're here to help. We're, we've got a very cogent solution, and we're just after kind of a conversation. We're it, it's I'm not hearing a lot of like high pressure sales. I'm not hearing a lot of like tactics that that bug the crap out of a lot of people. I'm hearing just kind of like a lot of business value woven into every motion that you guys make and take. Is that yeah. a pretty fair summary? Yeah, I, I think so. I, I wouldn't, I would not say we're like a super strong, aggressive sales culture. I have been in those environments before. And I've also honestly, in my last couple of companies I've worked at, I've had to temper that back. Like I worked yeah. at audit board where we sold to audit professionals and they're incredibly like risk adverse buyers who also are like, do not want to talk to salespeople. So like, we had a very unique sales org there and um, yeah, you just can't be that aggressive, that assertive with those, those, those buyer types. You really need to know who you sell to and kind of, you know, temper that for us. We're very much a consultative, you know, uh, sales organization and we're, we're reaching out to typically like your sales ops, revenue operations people, or like myself, sales development leaders or marketing leaders, which I think are fun personas to sell to. They're, they're, you know, people, people, they're smart. They get sales tech. They get hopefully generally what we do. Um, so we don't need to be super pushy. They either have some of these challenges or they don't. And with that, do you have any specific sales methodologies or people that you follow that you've particularly found incredibly valuable with their sales insight? Um, you know, when you, when you coach and when you, when you train your reps, <laughs> I do. So, um, this is one of my favorite books. So I'm a big Jeb Blount fan. Fanatical prospecting is like- um, Must my, read, must, yeah. must, must read. So when I first got to Lean Data about a year ago, we did a book club immediately, Fanatical Prospecting. Um, I think it's the best book for any SDR to read. Um, just teaches you the importance of all the prospecting you're doing day in and day out. Um, so that's that's one that uh, I'm a big believer in. I love, love Jeb's work. Um, I'm- uh, Follow like Sales Loft, Outreach, Six Sense, um, Gong, Chorus, all that. Like I, I follow all their blogs and things like that. I love to stay up to date on all the sales technologies out there. Um, there's so many good sales mentors out there. There's a guy by the name of Steve W. Martin, who's actually based here in Orange County too. He's been a mentor to me. Great, great sales leader. Um, ton, tons of good stuff out there. Fanatical prospecting is a must read for every SDR though. You require that of all your own SDRs? So the 22 that you have on staff that they have to read? I don't. I, I made it an optional book club and we got, you know, like half the team that engaged and, and read it with us. And we met every single week to review chapters and stuff like that. And it was really yeah. good experience for the folks that did it. Um, but I don't, I don't hard require it, no. Yeah. It's funny. Um, Jeb, a lot of his work too from Fanatical Prospecting, if you follow like the subsequent kind of like tentacles, he's been so prolific about writing about every part of the sales cycle. But one of the other things that I really love about um, some of his work that directly relates back to SDRs is kind of like the behavioral or the cognitive psychology um, that he's woven into, like the mindsets. Um, my personal favorite is like even the studies of the human brain and how it re reacts to rejection, um, <clears throat> which is, you know, common. And he relates in fanatical prospecting the story of, you know, it's like falling off a horse, right? Like, and what do you do when you fall off a horse or you're teaching a kid to ride? You got to put them back on as yeah. fast as possible because the human brain like literally interprets rejection as more severe than physical pain. Um, so it, it's like building the callus, if you will, of, you know, what's the best advice for someone that had a really shitty call and got rejected on a Take cold right call, back. right? On to the next one. No, I, I say that all the time. I'm like, for anyone that has fear of making calls, like you're probably not going to ever meet this person face to face. So get over that. Um, you're thinking about them probably a hell of a lot more than they're thinking about you. Um, you're also like any given year as an SDR, you might make seven, 8,000 phone calls. Like the chances of all of them going well, zero. It, most of them, you're going to have some sort of stumble. It's not going to go well. So just get over that. You do your best. You practice. Um, we do mock calls um, groups every single week that the team gets together and, and practices goes around the horn. Um, so always be practicing, um, but you just got to pick up the phone and go. And if you have a bad call, the quickest way to get over it is yeah, exactly that, Eric. It's just pick up, pick up, pick up the phone again. 
What are some of the other disciplines that you look to instill, you know, coaching style on your team? You know, you just mentioned mock call groups. Um, are there other activities that you find sharpen the sword for your yeah. team? Yeah, uh, we do. We do a lot of lunch and learns too. So um, I'm always empowering my team to say, "Hey, if you like are doing something that is leading to a lot of success for you, don't keep it to yourself. Share that." And so we uncover. They like they feel empowered to come to me and say, "Hey, I'm, I'm like." you know, using this email template or this sequence and it's working well and we'll dig in on it and develop a training around it. Maybe um, recent example would be like one of my reps was saying he was having a lot of success with um, some new Salesforce and LinkedIn sales nav kind of integration and some of the different filters that LinkedIn sales navigator has. So we put together one of my managers and him put together a training. They did it for the whole team. And then we ended up, it was so good. We did it for the whole revenue org. We wanted all the AEs and stuff to see it too. Um, so we're big on like constant education and training at the company. I think that's, um, largely fostered by our, um, VP of sales enablement, um, Julie Rossick. She's, um, she's great. She's a former bag carry and salesperson herself. So she gets it. And, um, she's done a great job of just developing a culture of training. And like, anytime we come up with something, we're like, Hey, this, we think this would be really applicable. Okay. She's like, okay, who's the audience? And she digs in and starts helping us kind of develop curriculum around it. And we, we roll it out. However, we decide, decide to. Um, so yeah, we do mock cold call groups. We do constant training. Um, we even like on Friday mornings, um, I would say like probably every other Friday we get together as an SDR team on zoom and we'll play, um, this game called talking points and talking points, um, basically throws up slides on the screen that you don't know what they're going to be ahead of time. And you just got to roll with the presentation, whatever it is. And so what I've found is it helps people like kind of warm up. So we'll do it on Friday morning and just gets people like, you know, shake it out, get ready to go. And on top of it, you have to really think on your toes. And so it's a lot of fun. You know, we're like, people are laughing, having a good time. Uh, and then I'll, I'll, you know, throw a little bit of money at whoever wins that, that Friday morning. It's just a little spiff for, for playing. I love that. That's so cool. That yeah, really fun. It, it, it's hilarious. I don't know what this, this game, like where they get the slides, but they are the most hilarious stock imagery that shows up like, and it's so <laughs> random. And so you'll get a topic that you have to talk about that you've picked beforehand. So it'll give you like three options as decided by the audience. You pick it, the topic. So you'll know what your topic's going to be, but you don't know what the slides are going to be. They're going to support the topic. So you got to really think on your toes as these slides start popping up. But can you give an example of like a recent one just so uh, I get a mental image? Yeah, it'll be like, um, um, you know, oh man, that's, that's so hard to like think of one example. Uh, they're just like the slides will be like a little um, plastic dinosaur or it'll be like um, a house that's on fire. And, and then the topic you were supposed to talk about was like, you know, why cake should be a breakfast food. And, and you're like, I, I don't know what, where to take this. <laughs> oh, so you're supposed to marry the two together. You have to marry the two. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's really interesting. Don't get any time to prep other than, you know, what you're, you're like, you're going to basically, it's a Ted talk. You're going to go up there and say, Hey, my name is Eric. And today I'm going to talk to you about blah, 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 whatever you've picked out of the three options that gave you. But then the first slide hits and you're just like totally thrown off guard by whatever was up there. And you got to just roll with it and somehow try and marry the spit, the, the pitch to the slide. That's actually fascinating because, you know, on a cold call, there is literally no rules of the road and right. conversations can go anywhere. And this would be training almost exactly that. Yeah. It's just, you gotta, you just gotta roll with it. So it's like objections are going to get thrown at you from any direction. You don't know what objections are going to give you now. Like I give my team like a, a cold call cheat sheet. That's got every objection they're going to possibly face and they're ready to like jump on it. But um, ideally they don't need that. They're just going to be so good at knowing our product and services and, and they know how to handle objections that they can think on their toes. And so this game is just kind of a playful way to, to sharpen that knife, as you said. That's awesome. And for our listeners uh, who can't see, Rob just pulled out like this awesome big, is that laminated? It looks it's laminated. laminated. It's so if you ever watch football, college or NFL, and you see the coaches holding the laminated play sheets, that's probably where that came from. <laughs> well, that's awesome. And I'm, I'm wondering like, you know, coaching objections can be really tough, right? Because we want to make sure that reps are staying malleable and, and, you know, human when they get objections, but how do you, how do you coach reps to take away really hard objections and work on them? 
Um, so yeah, we, we asked them to bring, if you get a new objection that you were like, how the heck do I, we, so we asked them, Hey, if the call was recorded, bring that call recorded call to your, your one-on-one -on -one with your manager. Um, and, and then let's break it down together. Um, we also are like big users of Slack internally. So Slack is like, if you want to, we have a channel just for sharing best practices. Um, so like this email template worked well, or, Hey, I got this objection. Here's how I handled it. It worked. It didn't work. Sometimes it's like, hey, I got this objection. I have no idea how to respond to this, whether it's over a call or email. And so people will kind of crowdsource, like, how would you handle this? Um, so Slack's pretty common. Otherwise, it's bring it to your one-on-one -on -one with your manager, and then you guys can tackle it together. That's awesome. I mean, it sounds like you really have your bases covered with all of the tech stack and tools and processes and maybe even workflows that kind of anticipate, um, like the structure itself anticipates your ability to 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 grow and level up with yeah. your team. Yeah. My, I think it's like the best thing. Um, so when I mentioned Steve Martin earlier, um, one of my mentors who's a great sales leader. And um, the thing I learned about him was just like, kind of, it sounds weird, but like kind of always being paranoid, always thinking ahead about mm. what could or couldn't happen. And like always just being prepared for that. I mean, he's uh, like a, a, almost a control freak in a sense. Like he's a very hands-on um, you know, former CRO, um, who just leaves nothing to chance. He's always got everything kind of pre-planned, premeditated. Um, and that's something I, I was not, I did not used to be that way. Um, and, and that was something I, I learned from him. And so are you walking through kind of like your, so along those lines, always be paranoid as a, as an example, I'm, I'm picturing kind of an Andy Grove style, you know, who can, what, what could go wrong here um, in this scenario? And then even walking new reps through, you know, those kind of scenarios, even if they haven't experienced them firsthand to prepare them? Is that the, a fair characterization of what's going on there? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. I mean, it's always thinking about like what could go wrong from no matter what it is. I think as a leader, like I'm always trying to think a step ahead and um, whether it's like a new process we're going to roll out, like, hey, we suddenly want to send calendar invites from SDRs instead of from the AEs calendars. Okay. Let's think about what could go wrong with this. And let's try and oh, think yeah. through all of that before we bring it to the team and roll it out. And I think it used to be something where I would just tend to think, okay, this is probably the right way to do it. Let's just go ahead and train the team, roll it out. And then something goes wrong and you're like, shit, uh, now I look stupid. I should have thought about that. So now I'm always like, take it, like pause for a minute, think about what could go wrong. What are the ne negative implications with whatever, whatever it is, slow down, make sure you roll things out the right way. Um, and then as far as like, yeah, the SDR training, I mean, I'm constantly asking like our top performing SDRs, like, you know, what could I have taught you earlier on that would have helped you be more successful and like always getting your people's feedback too on what's working, what's not working, what could, could we do better for new, new hires and stuff like that and incorporating it earlier. What are some of the, the responses that you've got that you found kind of like eye-opening or enlightening around, you know, what could I have taught you that... <clears throat> I didn't. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, the biggest one, the most recent one was that creativity thing. So not only yeah. did we like add creativity to the four C's and what we test for in interviewing, but we also, it's, um, uh, we just did a big training on it for the whole, it started with just SERs. And then um, we, we did the whole sales org on that too, because we're like, this is so true. Like creativity is so important in sales. And we showed them real life examples of like what good looks like um we pull up a person's linkedin and then we showed the corresponding email that the rep personalized and sent so like they can see what good looks like when it comes to creativity so that that was the most recent example um you know there's there's i love my reps that ask me lots of questions like why do you why do we do it this way how 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 come it's this way why is it why do we do it this way um because i'll i'll try and explain to them why we do it this way. And then sometimes they can actually, they do, they poke holes in it. They're like, well, what, what if we did it this way instead? Or how, like, what if we, um, it could be anything. How do we, why do we assign counts that way? Why do we have this round robin? What are this territory? And then oftentimes, yeah, they'll, they'll come up with something and I'll be like, oh, that, that is, that, that could work. Let me think about it. And I'm always like, let me think about it for a couple of days and think about if there's any negative implications of that. But I like <laughs> you bringing this to me and, I'm, and I do think there's something here. So let me further explore it. So I've got like a whole list of sticky notes on my desk of like ideas that are noodling around that I'm like, oh, we should test this or we should, you know, and, and a lot of them are brought to me by, by my SDRs. By the way, I think it's genius to provide examples for what good creativity looks like. Um, yeah. Cause there's so often people just don't have the right idea in their head, 
you know, like <laughs> not that to, my, I've like done over the years is always like, I'll train you. Uh, I train people and I'm like, yeah, you should do this. You should do this. But if you fail to tie it back to actually show them what good looks like, that's, that's, that's kind of a failure. Like you always, no matter what it is, want to show what good looks like. You can't just say, Hey, go prospect and extract personalization. So much more powerful when you say like, and here's an example. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I'm curious, what are some things that you do to help strengthen? Cause it sounds like you have like stellar SDRs. So what are some things that you do to help strengthen the SDR AE relationship? If your reps are tied to specific AEs or if there's a round Robin approach, um, are there any kind of <laughs> tips or tricks that you have for our listeners who are looking to strengthen that bond between those teams? Yeah. Super applicable. It's a very, a big theme for us this year. Um, and I do have stellar SDRs. I have to say that on the record. Um, so one-to-one is my preferred structure. Um, I've been in other structures. I be having been an AE and having been an SDR, I think having a one-to-one relationship with your person is, um, the best way to do it because it's going to breed partnership and it's going to breed communication. And, um, you know, sometimes you have conflicting personalities and maybe you have to make a change. It's very rare, but it has happened before. And that's okay. Some people just don't work well together. Um, and I usually will like, if you mix and match with someone else and then they end up working fine with a different personality type, that's okay. Um, that's usually the knock on it was like, well, what if they don't get along? It's like, mm, that's happened two or three times in the course of like four or five years for me. Um, that's fine. So, um, that's kind of first steps. I, I personally believe in a one-to-one model of AE and SDR, um, because those folks will be just like on speed dial for each other. They're texting, they're slacking, they're, talk, they're talking every day throughout the day. When you have more of like a round robin approach or like dynamic territories and stuff like that, where you're like an SDR setting meetings for any one of five different AEs, there's no way you're going to have the same level of relationship with, with that person. So that's something to consider. Um, the other thing is, I mean, you do need to be vocal about it. Like I am from day one, when we bring in a new hire, um, whether it be an AE or an SDR, I tell them like, this person is going to be your, your partner. They're your counterpart. Like, uh, you will not be successful without them and they will not be successful without you. And it's true. Um, so be, be vocal about communicating that and constantly reminding the team of that. Um, those are big. And so I did a, I did a session at our sales kickoff this year. And what I did in order to prepare for that was actually interviewed like four of our, uh, four or five of our top SDRs and four or five of our top AEs. And I said, what do you like and not like that your counterpart does? Mm-hmm. And then we did like a word cloud with it. And you'd be shocked at how, co- how, um, consistent or similar the word clouds were that we heard from AEs and that we heard from SDRs. Like the biggest thing that they had in common was they wanted over communication. They want to hear from their kind of our constantly about what you're working on, what's working, what's not working, where do you need me to step in and get involved? Um, And then the other thing is just like, this will be pointing fingers a little bit at AEs, but like AEs need to know that their pipeline is, they are responsible for that. It's not the SDR's problem. Like if if you don't have enough pipeline, you AE need to go, go get your hands dirty prospecting, make the cold calls, build your pipeline back to my outreach days. Like that was like, you could not rely on SDRs to book you meetings and build your pipeline. It was considered like incremental, whatever they got you, you had your own pipeline building goals that you had to hit. Um, and, uh, so that's, that's my, my long answer, um, Carolyn, but I think there's a lot that goes into it, but you got to be vocal on it. I I think as much as they can over communicate, be connected and see each other as partners, that's, that's key. You ever run into like rules of the road or swim lane conflicts with kind of the AEs owning their pipeline and dragging the SDRs along for the ride. Forgive my wording here if it's no. not accurate, but like where there's, hey, I, I'm one-to-one paired with with this AE and frankly, he or she is telling me to do X versus like their manager. <laughs> um, not as much as you might think, honestly. Okay. Um, uh, I think we're fortunate, like we have very good, healthy culture at, at lean data and everyone, you know, sees each other as equals and, and partners. Um, so generally we adopted this sort of, um, you know, mindset pretty well, I would say, but I know there's, there's certainly other places where there's a lot more finger pointing and things like that. Um, so even as a leader, like you have to over communicate what you expect. And like, I, as the sales development leader, still go speak to our AEs to tell them, Hey, this is the way things should be. And this is the best practice and stuff like that. So that there's no, um, no gray area. There's no mysteries out there. Like they know what their SDRs are supposed to be doing and they know what their SDRs manager is telling them to do. 
Um, so yeah, that they don't, they don't just go kind of lone wolf it and do what they think is best. Like, no, no, that's not how we operate. <laughs> and I, my, my SDRs know that they can come to me. Like if, if some, if they're being asked to do something that's outside of their scope, um, of work, uh, or, you know, they know they can go to their manager and if needed, their managers will come to me and pull me in to, to situations if, if we need to address something with the account executive or whatever, but super, super rare. Makes sense. Well, this, I feel like the time just flies by when we're digging deep and, and going into kind of like these best practices. And these are truly best practices for, um, our audience members who might want to get in touch with you or, or learn more or pick your brain further. Um, Rob, where would, where would you recommend, um, they, they hit you up at? Yeah. LinkedIn's great. So I'm active on LinkedIn. Uh, it's Rob Simmons. Um, but you better connect, uh, connect with a personal note. So I want to know that you saw this, uh, <laughs> podcast, give some attribution here. And, uh, that way I know how you, how you found me and I will absolutely, uh, accept. I love it. Love it. Yeah. It's great. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us today. This was awesome. I'm really excited for, especially for some of our younger, newer listeners to listen to this podcast and get inspired for SDR work. You know, it's, yeah. it's great. My pleasure. It was fun. Thank you for having me and happy to come back anytime.